Okay, I think we should start now. Okay, so um, welcome, every, welcome everyone uh, to uh, Everett's uh, fourth, fourth guest lecture. Um, today's guest speaker will be uh, Simon Rubenstein Salzedo, um, and he'll be talking about uh, the, div uh, the division points of hypocycloids. So um, I'll, play, I'll let Simon take it away. Okay, so uh, I think Bryce um, hit. Is how do I type with present now? Yeah, I think this works. Um, okay, so can you see my uh, my screen? And okay, so um, so first of all, um, can you see my uh, my slides now? Oh uh, yeah, I think I think you can see the slides. Okay, yeah, and now how do I get the chat in so that I can still view it? Um, maybe maybe like this. Uh, let's see if this works. Um, okay, so now I think I can see both of them. Um, yeah, so if we, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about division points of hypocycloids, and this is joint work with Nitya Mani, who at the time was a high school student. Um, this was a few years ago, so she's now just about to start her PhD. Um, and feel free to, to ask questions whenever. So I have a chat window open uh, separately, so I should be able to, to see it. Um, if, I, if I miss something, then maybe someone else can, um, can mention that to me. OK. Um, OK, so this is going to be about what can we do with a compass and straight edge? What things can we construct in, in this way? And so first, we need to know what the rules of the game are. So what we can do is if we have two points that we've already constructed, then we can connect them with a line. So here are two points. I can draw a line through them. So I can construct this line using, using my straight edge. And similarly, if I have uh, two constructed points, I can draw a circle with one of them as a center that, that passes through the other. So here I have two points. Here's a circle centered at this point over here and that passes through this other point over here. Another thing I can do is if I have um, um, if I have two lines or circles or, or one of each um, that I've already drawn, I can um, I can make the intersections of them. So here is a line and a circle. Those are the intersection points. So these are constructible points. Uh, and finally, it, um, if I have a line or a circle that I've drawn, I can construct a random point on it. So here's a circle, here's a random point on the circle. And then I don't get to assume any special properties of that point other than that it lies on that line or circle. Um, and so it's natural to ask, and people have since, since ancient, ancient Greeks, what can you do with these tools? What sorts of figures can you construct? And for a simple example, you can construct an equilateral triangle in this way. So here's how we do it. We take these two points, uh, okay, with a line segment connecting them maybe. Um, now I construct a circle centered at this point on the right, passing through this point on the left. So that's this red circle here. And then I do the, the other way around, a circle centered at, at this left point, passing through this right point. And then I form, well, either one of these two points of intersection, let's just say this one, so that's this blue point, and those three points form an equilateral triangle. So we can construct an equilateral triangle using, using these tools. Another thing we can do is we can bisect an angle. So here's how we do that. I pick a random point on, let's say, the, the, uh, this line or this ray, um, and that's this lower red point. And I draw a circle uh, centered here, passing through this point, and this intersects this other ray at some point. So that's this other red point. And now I draw circles of equal radii uh, centered at these two red points. Um, I said in, that's not one of the primitive rules of the game, but it's easy enough to, to figure out how to do that. Um, so the, these are these, these two blue circles, and they intersect at this blue point. And that blue point lies on the angle bisector. So this green line over here is the angle bisector. You can also construct a square. So here's how you do that. Um, we first extend the line through these two points, and then we draw a circle centered at, let's say, this point over here, passing through this point, and it intersects this line at another point, that's this red one. Now we construct a circle centered at the left point, passing through the red one, so that's this left circle, and the other way around, centered at this red point, passing through the left point, so that I have these two blue circles, and there are these two points of intersection. 
So let's draw a line through them, or if you like, through one of them and, and this middle black point. Now, this line intersects the red circle at, at a point, actually two points, but choose one of them, let's say this one, and that's this green one. And now we draw two, these two brown circles, one centered at this green point passing through this uh, middle black point, and another one centered at this left black point passing through the middle one. So the, the, these are these, these two circles in brown, and well, they have one point of intersection over here and another one over here. And this is the fourth vertex of a square. So you can construct a square. So a natural question, which, which goes back uh, for several millennia to the time of ancient Greece, is which regular polygons can you construct with a compass and straight edge? And the ancient Greeks figured out how to do these, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12, 15, 16, and so forth. And these are the numbers of the form 2 to the k, 3 times 2 to the k, 5 times 2 to the k, and 15 times 2 to the k. Is that all? No, it's not all. You can do more, but they're harder. Um, and Gauss figured out how to get 17, 257, and 65537. And, and, and these and combinations of those with these, let's say, 17 times numbers of this form and 257 times numbers of this form and, and, and so forth. And in fact, here's a general theorem by Gauss and um, later completed by Wanzel, is that we can construct a regular m-gon using compass and straight edge if and only if n is a power of 2 times a product of distinct primes of the form 2 to the 2 to the r plus 1. And these numbers, these primes of the form 2 to the 2 to the r plus 1 are the Fermat prime. So 17, 2, uh, 3, 5, 17, 257, 6, 5, 5, 3, 7. And those are the only ones we know. There probably aren't any more, but we don't know. We've, we've checked a, a bunch of values of r up to 24 or something like that, and there are no more primes um, up to that size. But they get really big really quickly, so we don't really know. Um, you, know you can't check so many of them. Um, and uh, so this theorem, uh, you, um, you, uh, you prove this typically using Galois theory, which is uh, an important part of um, abstract algebra, standard part of the undergraduate mathematics curriculum. So, um, so I actually taught it in, in my abstract algebra class to high school students uh, in the spring, and we, and we did this theorem. Um, um, so uh, students in my classes learned this um, when, they're, when they're younger. But usually, uh, people would wait for college to, uh, to, uh, to learn about how to do this. OK, so let's, let's now reframe this gauss von Sol theorem um, so that we can, uh, uh, we can modify and generalize it. Um, and so a construct, a reg if you, a regular n-gon is basically the same as saying divide a circle into n pieces of equal arc length. Because if you have a regular n-gon, you can circumscribe a circle around it, and the vertices of the n-gon split the circle into n pieces of equal arc length. So then we can ask, what about other curves? Which other curves can we divide into n pieces of equal arc length using a compass and straight edge? And there's one other classical result beside the, besides the gauss wanzel theorem, um, and that concerns the Lemnus gate. So Lemnus gate is this figure eight curve, and here's the equation of it, x squared plus y squared, squared is equal to x squared minus y squared. And Abel proved an interesting theorem about division points of this curve. He proved that it's possible to divide the Lemnus gate into n pieces of equal arc length, if and only if n is a power of two times a product of distinct Fermat primes. So in other words, the, um, the ones that we can do for the circle and the ones we can do for the Lemnus gate are exactly the same. Um, and this should be, this should seem very surprising. Um, why, should, why should these completely different curves have, have the same answer? And in fact, there's a very deep reason for this, which relates to, uh, to algebraic number theory and class field theory. This is quite a deep result. Um, so in, in case anyone has seen any, any algebraic number theory or class field theory, uh, the division points of a circle are related to, to abelian extensions of Q, whereas the division points of a lemnus gate are related to abelian extensions of Q adjoint I. But um, if you don't know what that means, that's something to look forward to. It's a very beautiful subject. 
Yeah, so this, this theorem of, of Appel is much less well known than the theorem of Gauss and Bunsell. But it, it, it inspired us to, um, to look at what we could do with other curves comparing these two results. So now, um, so before I introduce the hypocycloids, um, uh, this is inspired perhaps by a famous toy called the spirograph. So um, this, is, this is a rather old toy. Um, perhaps some of you um, have them or, or have had them in the past. Um, what, uh, the way it works is you have a bunch of, a bunch of funny shaped pieces um, with gears on them and you can roll one of them around the others because they have, they have gears. And then they have holes in them so you can put a pen inside the hole and move it around and see, uh, see what path that point takes as you, as you roll it around. And here on the right, you have some uh, some things that you can construct, some figures you can construct using uh, uh, using the spirograph. So a very simple example of a spirograph is a hypocycloid. So the way a hypocycloid works is you start with two circles, a big circle and a small circle. So here we have this big circle, which is this dashed one on the outside, and then we have this little circle which is internally tangent to it. So it, it's, it's tangent um, and it's on the inside of it. And now you pick a point on this, uh, on this small circle. So here I've chosen the tangency point, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and now you roll this little circle around the edge of the big one and you trace the trajectory of this point. And that's this thick curve over here. So um, in this case, I've drawn it where the ratio of the radii is three. So the big circle has radius three and the small circle has radius one up to, up to, some, up to some, uh, some constant multiple at least. Um, and so that's why we get these three cusps. So this, the, 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 the ratio is three. And here is a small collection of hypocycloids for different radii. So um, uh, these ones on top have integer um, have integer ratios. And it's three, four, five, six. If it's an integer, you can read it off by how many cusps it has. So you see this one has three cusps, four, five, and six. And the, these ones on the bottom, these have non-integer uh, ratios. And the way you can read them off here is uh, um, these are all rational. These all have rational uh, ratios, and the number of cusps is equal to the numerator, and the denominator is the number of times we go around. Um, so here. Um, by the time I get here, I've gone around the circle once. And then here, I go around the circle a second time. So this one on the left is five over two. This one over here, well, you can count, it has seven cusps. And how many times does it go around? Well, up to here, now I've gone around once. And then over here, now I've gone around twice and I'm back to where I started. So this one's seven over two. Similarly, this one is seven over three, and this one is eight over three. So these, are hypocycloids. So are there any questions now before we move on? So feel free to type something in the chat. Okay, I guess not. So then we'll just continue. Um, so, so we're interested in the division points of, of hypocycloids. So we have to ask a precise question. So let's set our parameters. Let's fix the radius of the small circle to be one and the radius of the large circle to be some number C greater than one. And well, there are actually two questions we can ask. The first one is suppose we have the C hypocycloid centered at zero, zero, drawn on the page. Now, can we divide it into n pieces of equal arc length? So that's question one. And question two is the hypocycloid isn't drawn on the page. We, what we have to do is we have to construct the points that would divide the hypocycloid into n pieces of equal arc length once we put it on at the end. But we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to use the hypocycloid to help us with our construction. So we're not allowed to intersect things with the hypocycloid in particular. Um, so the second question is actually the one that Abel asked uh, and answered about the lemnus gate. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, this hasn't been answered in the case of the pre-drawn lemnus gate, and I think it would be very interesting um, to, to do that. So it may have a different answer because there's more stuff you can do in this case. So 
Um, so in the case of hypos likewise, we considered both of these questions. And so, so the difference between these is that in the first case, usually the, the way you do it is you want to construct a circle whose radius is equal to the distance from the center uh, of each n division point. Whereas in the second point case, just constructing the radius isn't good enough. You have to construct both the x and the y coordinates. So that may be harder. Well, in the first case, you don't really have to do it with a circle. You could do it with just constructing the x coordinates, say. But our approach will be constructing, constructing the radius in this case. Whereas in the second case, that, that's not good enough. You have to construct both of them. So this is uh, a more difficult task. So in order to, uh, to answer these questions, we need to know something about which numbers can we, which numbers or which points can we construct. And so, so our setup is we'll start with 0, 0, and 1, 0 pre-drawn, pre-marked. And um, how can we tell which points x, y could be constructed with a compass and straight edge? And so one thing that's pretty clear is you can construct x, y if and only if you can construct x, 0, and 0, y. And of course, there's not really any difference between 0, y, and y, 0. So, so let's just restrict to the case of determining which points of the form x, 0 are constructible. So uh, our definition is we say that a real number x is constructible if we can construct the point x, 0 using compass and straight edge, starting with 0, 0, and 1, 0. So let's see what we can do. Uh, so the first thing is that you can add constructible numbers. If, zero, if, if A and B are constructible, then A plus B is also constructible. And here's how we do it. So we start with 0, 0, A0, B0 on the line. And now we take this segment from 0, 0 to B0, and we just translate it over so that it starts from A. And the resulting point is A plus B0. So I haven't told you how to, how to translate a segment, but it's, um, there's a simple procedure for doing that. And subtraction is similar. So a and B are constructible, A plus B, A minus B are both constructible. Um, same with multiplication. Um, so here's how you multiply A and B. So we start with 0, 0, 1, 0, A0, and B0. And now we draw a circle centered at 0, 0, passing through B0. And then we pick a random point on it and the line connecting them. Now I connect that point to 1, 0, and then I draw a parallel line through A0. So the parallel line, constructing a parallel line through a given point is another thing you can do with compass and straight edge. So this, this second line over here intersects this, uh, this red ray, uh, this blue point. And now that blue point has distance AB from, from the origin. So if I draw a circle centered here, passing through this point, it intersects the, the axis at, at AB0. So that shows that AB is constructible. Similarly, you can do division with a rather similar construction. Um, so you start with, if you want to construct A over B, um, so I draw a circle of radius A, and then I pick a random point and draw, draw the ray through it. And then I connect that to B0 and draw a parallel line through 1, 0. And this intersects uh, this ray at this blue point. And that point has distance A over B from the origin. So we can divide, of course, as long as we're not dividing by 0. And we can also take square roots, again, only, um, of course, only of non-negative numbers. So here's how we do that. Um, so we start with the point 0, 0, 1, 0, and a plus 1, 0. So I'm going to try to construct the square root of a, but I want it, it works better if I do a plus 1, 0. And now I construct a circle whose diameter uh, uh, goes from 0, 0 to a plus 1, 0. So that's the circle here. And then I draw a vertical line through 1, 0. And um, then this segment over here, this blue segment, has length square root of a. So then I just move this segment over um, through 0, 0. And so I construct the point square root of a, 0. So, so what we've learned is 0 and 1 are constructible. Sums and differences of constructible numbers are constructible. Products and quotients of constructible numbers are constructible, as long as you're not dividing by 0. Square roots of constructible numbers, or at least non-negative constructible numbers, are constructible. And that's all. OK, can I show square roots again? Yeah, so here's the construction for square root. Um, so this segment over here has length square root of a, which you can show, for example, by some similar triangle argument 
there are lots of similar triangles when you start drawing uh, triangles like that, which is a right triangle. Okay, so is, is that okay? Oh, so by the way, if you're interested in these constructions, there are some websites like Euclid the Game and, and Euclidia that give you various tasks for how you how you can um, tasks for things you need to construct using compass and straight edge. Then they're a lot of fun. Uh, does the point um, a plus one zero have to be a plus one and not a? Well, so I'm trying to construct the square root of a. So the the point is that this this length is one and this length is a. You could presumably come up with a lot of other constructions for for this. So you use the point a plus one to get the square root of a, but you know you, you, um, there there must be lots of other square root constructions. This is just the one that that I happen to think of when preparing these slides. Um, yeah. So um, so uh, okay. So these are all the constructible numbers. So for example, the cube root of two pi and e are not constructible. This isn't actually obvious that you can't write them in this way. In the case of the cube root of two. This follows from a bit of uh, some the basic field theory. Basically the fact that x cubed minus two is an irreducible polynomial, doesn't factor over the rationals. Um, but that, that still requires um, a little bit of knowledge in order to do a bit of field theory, linear algebra. As for pi and e, well, this follows from the fact that they are transcendental numbers. They're not roots of non-zero polynomials with integer coefficients. And these are hard theorems. Um, uh, certainly requires calculus to prove that, that these are transcendental. You come up with a bunch of uh, a bunch of magic integrals. So, um, so this is these these proofs are very clever and uh, and very tricky. Um, so not an obvious fact at all. But once you know that they are transcendental, it follows that you can't express them in 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 these ways. So they're not constructible. Okay, so now let's return to hypocycloids. So if we, if we have a C hypocycloid where C is a rational number, A over B in lowest terms, well, there's a formula that tells you the arc length of a curve. So um, some, some, in, some formula involving calculating an integral. And when you apply it to the case of a hypocycloid, you find that the total arc length is 8B times C minus one. Now you can parameterize the arc length up to some up to some point, you parameterize it by the angle um, through the, the, the point from uh, of the point you're uh, of, of a point on it relative to the positive x-axis and the origin. Um, the arc length up to that point is eight times c minus one over c and sine squared of c times phi over four, at least up to the first cut. But after that, you probably have to make some correction. But this is this is good enough for us. Um, and you can also work out what is the radius of the point at which the arc length up to that point is equal to x. And here's the formula for it. R is the square root of c squared minus 2c plus 2c minus 1 times 2, 1 plus cs over 4 minus 4c squared minus 1. And at first glance, you might think this looks like a mess. But that's not what you should, um, that's not actually how you should think about this. Um, what you, what you should see is that this is something that's built out of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots. In other words, just the sort of thing that you can do with constructible numbers. And in particular, if S is constructible, then so is R. Now, what, um, um, what happens when, we, when I try to do the end division points of this? Well, the end division points are the points of arc length this 8b times c minus 1 times 1 over n, 2 over n, 3 over n, and so forth. So in particular, the arc length up to any, any particular n division point is always rational. And when I plug it in here, I always get a constructible number. Therefore, we've now proven the following theorem, which answers the first question completely. If c greater than 2 is any rational number, then we can divide a pre-drawn c hypocycloid into n pieces of equal arc length for any n using uh, compass and straight edge. So you can always do it in this case. So this answers the first question entirely. So any questions about that?
Um, how did you get that formula? Oh, um, this one over here, this is just um, plugging it into the standard arc length formula uh, from calculus and doing some and doing some manipulations. There's not th there's no real cleverness that goes into into getting this formula. It's it's just a, a standard uh, calculation with an arc length formula. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, well, let's see. Why are we interested in hypocycloids? Yeah, great question. Um, so we weren't originally interested in hypocycloids. What we were interested in is solving questions like this. And we tried a bunch of curves, and most of them we couldn't do. Um, and eventually, uh, um, so we went on Wikipedia and looked for a we looked at a list of interesting curves and tried a whole bunch of them, and most of them we couldn't do. And then the hypo and then and then we tried the hypocycloid, and we could do it. So we are looking for curves with certain interesting properties related to um, re related to parameterizing radius and, and arc length. So we just plugged every everything into the formula until we saw something where we could answer the problem, where uh, where it had a um, a formula that was nice enough to work with. So, so we uh, we studied um, the proof of Appel's theorem on the lemmas gate very carefully, and saw what we needed to do in order to um, in order to pull this off. But, but, most, but the lemmas gate has certain very interesting properties that most other curves don't have. Um, yeah. So here's here's an example. Um, uh, so if you want to calculate the first five division point of the three cusp hypocyclo, you throw it into this, this radius formula and you find that the radius is square root of 33 over five. Okay, kind of a strange number, but it's, um, it's something expressible in terms of square roots and, um, and standard arithmetic operations. So we draw a circle of radius square root of 33 over five, that's here, and we intersect it with the, the hypocycloid and it, uh, one of the points of intersection is there. It's not actually on the y-axis. It's just pretty close to it. Um, so you can, if you look carefully, you can see that dot's not centered on the y-axis. It's just close to it. So that that's the first of the five division points. Right there. Okay. So now let's turn to the case where there's no pre-drawn hypocycloid. So this is a harder question, um, and we answered it only in the case of c equals three. So the three cusp to one. Um, what we found is that you, um, we can construct all the n division points of a three cusp hypocycloid if and only if n is one, two, three, or six. So you can only divide it up into six pieces of, of equal arc length using compass and straight edge if you don't get the hypocycloid to help you. And to remember the difference is that now we have to construct both the x and the y coordinates rather than just the radius. And so what we found is you can't express these in terms of addition, subtraction. Um, so you can't. So for any for any other n, there's some n division point where you can't express the x and y coordinates in terms of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots. And that's because you also need cube roots. Um, uh, so here's how we how we did this. What we did is we figured out a formula for the first n division point of the of the three cusp hypocycloid or the x coordinate of it. And it's a root of this polynomial. So note that this is a cubic polynomial. If I plug in any value of n, I get uh, some cubic term in x, some, some linear term in x, and some constant term. There happens to be no quadratic term, but that's just kind of an accident. Um, and it, um, so we know from general theory that roots of irreducible cubic polynomials cannot be expressed in terms of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots. Um, so irreducible means it doesn't factor into two polynomials over the rational numbers. So therefore, we have to show that when n is not 1, 2, 3, or 6, this polynomial is irreducible. Actually, we only did this in the case where n is not a multiple of 3. Um, because if n is a multiple of 3, constructing all the n division points certainly includes constructing the n over 3 division points. And our, our proof, um, well, it doesn't really, doesn't really work out very well in the case when n is a, um, is a multiple of three. So we restrict it to the case where n is not a multiple of three. And then I guess we have to check nine uh, just by hand. 
Uh, but that's that's just a minor detail. A single polynomial is not so hard to check if it's irreducible, but an entire family of them all at once is is trickier. So let me say a little bit about how we check that this polynomial is irreducible. So the first ingredient that we need is the p-adic valuation. So what's a p-adic valuation? So p is a prime, x is a non-zero rational number. The p-adic valuation of x is the exponent of p in the prime factorization of x. So for example, the two-adic valuation of 72, well, what's the prime factorization of 72? Well, it's two cubed times stuff. So that, that's that three. And the, the three-adic valuation, well, 72 is three squared times other stuff. So the three-adic valuation is two. And whereas one-fifth, this is five to the minus one times stuff. Well, there's no other stuff, but that doesn't matter. So the five-adic valuation of one-fifth is minus one. So the next thing we need is Newton polygons. So let me tell you what that is. So given a polynomial, a0 plus a1x plus dot 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 plus anx to the n, which has rational coefficients, and also we also take a prime p, we'll plot the points where, whose x coordinate is i from i equals zero to n, and whose y coordinate is the p-adic valuation of ai. So for example, consider this polynomial, uh, x cubed minus 162x squared, plus 63x minus 18, and p equals three. So for the a0 coefficient, that's minus 18, its three-adic valuation is two. So I plot the point zero, comma two. For the, the x to the one term, uh, my coefficient is 63. So that, that has p-adic valuation two. And then the quadratic term, uh, minus 162, the, the three-adic valuation is four. So that's the point two, four. And for three, coefficient is one, which has valuation zero. So I have these four points. And now the, um, the Newton polygon is, is the lower convex hull of the plotted points. What lower convex hull means is take a rubber band and, um, um, and see where the bottom of the rubber band would be, um, would hit, would, would catch on if I put it ar um, around all these points. So it doesn't see these ones because the, the bottom of the band only connects these two points. So this is the Newton polygon. And there's a very important theorem about the Newton polygon and valuations of the roots, which says that if, if you have a Newton polygon and it has a segment of slope s um, whose x length is a, so meaning the when you project it down to the x, uh, the x axis, the length of that segment is equal to a, then this polynomial f of x has exactly a roots, in, uh, counting multiplicity, um, whose p-adic valuation is minus x. So in this case, we have this segment of slope minus two thirds and its length of three. So that means it has three roots whose valuation is two thirds. Um, so that's what happens in, in that polynomial. Um, and, and we actually get exactly the same Newton polygon for our polynomials, for all the polynomials of this form when n is uh, when n is not one or two and it's not a multiple of three. Um, then it always has this mutant polygon. Um, therefore, all the roots have three adic valuation uh, two thirds. But this never happens for reducible cubic polynomials because if you have a, a reducible cubic polynomial, then it must have a linear factor whose valuation must be an integer and it can't be two thirds. I haven't told you what it means to have the adic valuation two thirds, um, but it's something that can happen for irreducible cubics, but it's not something that can happen for linear quadratic polynomials. And that completes the proof of our second theorem with no pre-drawn three couch typocyclic. So the reason that we couldn't do this for a general um, a general C, uh, C hypocycloid is that it's um, we don't know how to show um, uniformly that that um, the, these these polynomials are all irreducible. We can check any particular case, but showing that every single polynomial of a certain type is irreducible seems kind of tricky, and we weren't able to figure out how to do that.
Okay, so that's all the, the mathematics I want to talk about. So here's my, my shameless plug. Um, I'm the director of Euler Circle, where I teach college level mathematics classes to middle school and high school students and direct research projects. So, that, so this project I showed didn't come out of Euler Circle because it was before Euler Circle existed, but it's the same sort of thing that I, I do with some of the students at Euler Circle. In the fall, I'll be teaching two classes, an advanced class on Markov chains, which is, um, uh, a very important part of probability theory, and an intermediate class. The intermediate class is a year-long sequence um, on helping students transition from numerical answer problems to proof-based mathematics. And uh, so we're starting from the beginning. In the fall, we'll be focusing mainly on number theory, and we'll start we'll start from the beginning. And the last thing we do will be to determine which numbers are sums of two squares. So that's already quite an interesting theorem. The so applications for the fall classes are due July 26 see EulerCircle.com for uh, description, uh, more detailed descriptions of these classes, applications, and uh, more information about, about our program. So I, I really hope that some of you will, will join us in the fall for a lot of really interesting mathematics and seeing what, um, what mathematics looks like at, um, you know, beyond the competition curriculum, where it, it really gets much more exciting uh, when, you move, when you move beyond that stage. So thank you for your attention. Any any more questions, either about this stuff or anything else? No, no one has any questions. Notes later. Um, yeah, so I can um, let me just. Oh, wait, I have a web browser open here. Okay, let me let me post a link to them. Just give me a moment. So here, here's a link. How, how long do I expect a high school student to spend on a research project? I, um, my estimate is that it takes two years um, of very dedicated work for a very strong high school student to have a reasonable but far from certain chance of having done anything. Um, this is no joke. the time commitment of, of my classes. So the, um, the intermediate class meets for three hours a week, uh, 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. Pacific time on Mondays. The advanced class meets um, Tuesday and Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30, so four hours a week. Um, and then there'll also be um, problems to solve. Um, so some of the time in class will be devoted to solving problems and, and going over them, but that won't be enough time to do all of them. So you'll need to spend considerable time outside of class as well. So, uh, um, I do expect a pretty strong commitment. Okay, if that's all, uh, let's give uh, Simon a round of applause before um, we end the meeting. Um, uh, so.
So um, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I uh, ho hope you uh, hope you all you know come to the rest of the meetings as well. Uh, thanks, Simon. Um, I think that's it for uh, today. So thank you. Yep.